Welcome to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, brought to you by the experts at Maryfield Garden Center. Join us as we discover beautiful plants, new trends, and exciting ideas for your landscape. So let's get growing together. Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, bringing out the best in your garden. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mary Fields Gardening Advisor. David and I are so glad you could join us this morning, and uh, we hope you had a wonderful Christmas and Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and getting ready for the new year. Yes, good morning. Like Debbie was saying, I had a wonderful Christmas myself. I hope you did oh, as well. Oh, I did. Actually, one of the best, I think. And I said, you know, once you, get, once you get up to Christmas Eve, when we all of our family get together and celebrate Christmas Eve, getting to that, a little hectic, but after that, oh, just wonderful. Yeah, one sure. Of the best. And then, of course, the new year is coming right up. I know. Hard to believe. 2015. Whew. Crazy, crazy, crazy. It's going to be a good one. It is going to be a good one. It is. So today we're going to be talking, I'm speaking of the year, going to be talking about a year in gardening. Absolutely. I figured, you know, we're, what I call, I feel like I'm in this limbo. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you. It's like, you know, you go through this big holiday season. There's Thanksgiving. There's Christmas, right. you know, and it was just over. And uh, the Garden Center, of course, we're big into the after Christmas mm -hmm. sale. And then, of course, then New Year's coming up. So this is why I call this kind of a limbo. I was trying to think, well, what can we do? We're kind of in this transition time. Plus, it's the middle of winter, so there's not a whole lot to do outside in the garden. So what I wanted to do is what I'm calling a winter garden planner, talking about a few things that we can be doing now, uh, things like pruning and a little bit about winter protection and keeping everything looking good through the winter months, but also going to be taking a look ahead. I almost thought about retitling this program Planting Ideas, because that's a lot of what we're doing mm -hmm. today is talking about what we can be doing in January, February, March time period, so things we're doing now and also looking ahead for the next few months. That's right. Gardeners always have something to do. Yeah, there's always they something really to do, do, but it's also important to be looking ahead to what you want to be doing. That's right, and, and, get, and getting ready. So. Well, before we get started, just let you know what's happening at Maryfield Garden Center. As David mentioned, our after Christmas sale is in full swing, so if you are looking for some great bargains to get ready for next year's Christmas, Maryfield Garden Center is where you need to be. We've got 40 to 60 percent off on all the holiday items. That includes the ornaments, decorations, uh, custom-made, you know, pre-made uh, arrangements, uh, holiday arrangements, pre-made bows, holiday ribbon. What am I missing? Just a little bit of everything. Well, everything I, I thought was interesting. Uh, we opened early yesterday. Right. I, I got into work about 7.15 or something. Mm -hmm. And already it's nice. There's shoppers in there, stuff. And then later that afternoon, it's probably 2, 2.30 in the afternoon, I mm -hmm. saw one of the, the ladies from the morning that was there. Oh, really? and I, I went over and I was asking her, what, what I say, are you crazy or what? I said, you know, <laughs> didn't I see you at, at 7.15 when I got in this morning? And she's like, oh, well, yes, yes, I've, I've been here a while. She said, but I, I, I came in and then I went home, dropped my friend off and came back because there's still so much to see. And I said, yeah, it's like peeling away layers. Yeah. The more you dig into this, the more stuff reveals. I mean, I had customers finding stuff. I've been there all, all, the all, season. all season and <laughs> still finding things wow. I didn't realize was That's there. Great. So, yeah, there's so, so much there, like I said, it's just peeling away the layers right. and you keep finding more. Absolutely. So take advantage of that. 40 to 60 percent off, so it's, it's great. Our New Year's, or well, our hours for the rest of the holiday, we're now into our regular winter hours, Monday through Saturday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., Sundays from 9 to 5. We'll be open, well, actually, we'll close early on Christmas, I'm um, excuse me, New Year's. Eve will close at 5, so we open from 8 to 5, and then on New Year's Day we'll be open from 10 to 5. So that's the rest of the hours during the during the holiday season, so, and after the holidays, and getting into the new year. So new year, I'm, I'm having trouble wrapping my head around yeah. that. Well, that's why I say I feel like I'm in this limbo I time know. caught between the holidays. <laughs> Now, our seminars are going to be starting January 17th, and so you should be getting the seminar schedules within the next week or so. I'm not, we're not exactly, you know, with the holidays, it's hard to tell when they'll, the post office will actually get them out and that type thing. And hopefully we'll have them, uh, copies in the store at the beginning of the week. Uh, but you'll be able to access it online at maryfieldgardencenter.com. There's a couple to, that you'll need to sign up for, and I think that opens up like January 1. Uh, the sign-up registration for those, but lots of great, great topics this year. 
Oh yeah, always looking forward to that. And there are we've got some new uh, new instructors, new topics yes. that we haven't had before. So mm -hmm. even if you've been coming to seminars for years, uh, there's always something to keep you interested. If you have not attended the seminars, then put that on your to-do list. I mean, they're fun, they're entertaining, um, extremely <laughs> educational too. It's a nice way to spend the morning. It really uh, is. And I think uh, they put that up on the website yesterday. I was mm -hmm. talking with. Uh, Chris and Talking with Chris the other mm -hmm. day, so like as you said, it's on the website, and the other hard copies are at the printers. At the printers, so hopefully they will be here soon. Um, and I wanted to, to thank everybody for your response to my dad's book. It has just been amazing. Um, I know dad's been really pleased. He's going to be doing book signings today at the Fair Oaks location from 10 to 12, and uh, tomorrow at Gainesville from about 10:30 to 12. But I tell you, I, I mean, just amazing the response it's so heartwarming to hear you know some of the some of the comments that people said and i saw on facebook um somebody put a you know i think it was a picture of the book was was on the facebook and said look what i got for christmas oh so yeah. i said that thought that was so cool but the american dream is available so it's still great if you haven't gotten a gift for someone this is a great gift but it's, yeah, I've been enjoying it. I was reading last night. I'm down to about one chapter left. Are you? Yeah, uh, almost no, to the right. end. Okay, so don't tell them what you learned about me in there. Okay. <laughs> I did. I did want to tell them. I, was, I enjoyed the story about them. Uh, I guess when they were practicing with the horses, would have you oh, yeah. run around the horse <laughs> rink trying to lasso I you. I remember and, that like it was like it was yesterday. Yeah. Oh, Donnie Nelson would be practicing his lassoing, and, and me and my friends Jenny and Cindy would be running around the ring. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, kids, kids, kids. So. Um, so we will be taking phone calls later in the show. Uh, we haven't done that in a couple of weeks, so we hope you'll give us a call. And if you've got any questions, that'll be about the last 20 minutes of the show. So stay tuned for that. So I think that is all the announcements for, for now. If we think of anything else, we'll let you know. Good. Well, I wanted to um, kind of kick the show off talking a little bit about the winter landscape. Uh, of course, that's a beautiful snow picture, and I... And I I love the snow, and a lot of people do, because you know it really shows off the structure. It makes the whole landscape look different. Uh, I feel a little weird talking about this when we're having 50, almost right. 60 degree <laughs> temperatures, but you never know what the weather's going to do around here. And I thought, well, let's go ahead and and talk a little bit about the winter garden and winter damage in the garden. And like I said, it can be a beautiful thing. Uh, so we're talking about snow, and I go through a couple other pictures here. I've got ice, of course. Um, and snow and ice are not inherently bad. I mean, snow is not only beautiful, but it forms an insulating layer over the plants. It's sort of the same thing with ice. You know, like you see, is, you know, it makes the plants look really dramatic with the icicles and all on there. But the good thing about ice and snow, of course, is that it does perform, it forms this protective barrier. The temperature is sort of um, held at 32 degrees. It buffers it against the wind. Um, it provides moisture for the plants. So there's a lot of good things to say about, but as always, too much of a good thing becomes a problem. So when we talk about winter damage, um, ice and snow damage, really it's not a matter of cold. It's really just the weight of it. And sometimes the sheer weight of right. ice and snow in there can cause uh, trees to fall over, collapse and break and damage like that. Uh, now, like I said, we haven't really seen this, but if you think back, we had snow on Thanksgiving, and now it's 50 degrees at Christmas right. and so on. Uh, I did want to let everybody know, if, if you were to encounter this, and, and I hope we don't, but if we get into that situation where you do get where shrubs are literally the weight of them right. pulls them down, or trees where branches start to split and mm -hmm. snap, uh, some of these things can be corrected, and we put a couple of videos um, on our website at maryfieldgardencenter.com that kind of guide you through how to correct those problems. It's more involved than we have time to go right. into today. So that's, if you were to run into those type of problems, mm -hmm. uh, go maryfieldgardencenter.com and you can look those videos up. Yeah, there's one called Tree Repair and one called Repairing Damaged Shrubs. Good, I couldn't remember the yeah. exact titles of mm -hmm. it. Now, a couple other things I want to say super quick because I know mm -hmm. we're over on our time. But winter damage also comes in the form of sometimes just extreme temperatures. Yes. We saw that last year where we were down into single digit temperatures. It can also be a result of desiccation or just drying out. 
Uh, so that's really most of the time we run into winter damage is desiccation or dry. Fortunately, we had lots and lots of moisture this year, so everything's well watered and we're in good shape there. Uh, the only other thing, like I said, is extremely cold temperatures. Not a lot you can do to prevent or treat that, but if you had valuable, vulnerable plants like gardenias or, uh, you know, we had problems in that, you can protect them. Uh, we sell special things like this uh, shrub guard. It's just a, it's a synthetic fabric, but it's nice, you know, it's pretty, it's attractive, mm -hmm. and you Very can nice. wrap your plants in that. There's also frost cloth, which I brought in to show you. Again, these are basically insulating blankets that you can use on susceptible plants or vulnerable plants to protect them against mm -hmm. the cold. So um, hope we haven't faced those conditions. Hopefully we don't. That's right. But if, um, if you run into it, there's a couple pointers for you. Great. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back and talk about uh, a gardening year. What a perfect saying for this time of year. It is. It makes me just think, Happy New Year, that's everybody. Right. It's, it's on the way it's now. It's on the way. Well, we're talking about a gardener's calendar, and so that's a perfect time to, to remind you to pick up your free Maryfield Garden Center calendar. If you haven't as yet, it's filled with beautiful pictures and great gardening tips. So, perfect to have. Exactly. Month by month, and mm -hmm. that's kind of what we're doing today, and right now we're talking about things that you can do in the garden right now. We'll just get right back to our pictures okay. kick this off. Because uh, again, we're talking about this is, you know, hey, you're home and, you know, you, you got a little cabin fever, want to get out and work in the yard. Uh, that's what we're talking about. And it really is beautiful during the winter. The garden can be very beautiful. Oh, I love every season that mm -hmm. goes through. And it's just, as I always say, it's just a matter of finding the beauty and right. how you choose to view it. Of course, you know, it's not like we're loaded up with blooms and blossoms, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, really anything that adds a little color to the landscape really pops out, like you can see in that. Um, that winterberry holly mm -hmm. uh, and the use of the evergreens and grasses and of course then the snow accentuates everything. But one of the things uh, that you can be doing out in the garden is the winter is really the best time of year to be pruning most yes. your uh, deciduous trees and shrubs. Uh, of course this is a big topic and we'll have both seminars and classes. We've got two of them coming up this winter on how to prune. Uh, and we'll, I'm sure, be having a TV show focusing more right. attention on this. But one of the points I wanted to make today is while the plants are in their dormant season, you know, they've, they've shed their leaves, they're in this state of rest during the winter months, uh, this is the perfect time to go out and do most of your pruning. And really, I'm talking about that could be January, February, early March, you know, just you, you're, right. you find what fits your schedule. You're in there and like say get a nice day and go out there and, and go to it. And so as you were seeing like in that picture before, crepe myrtle is a good example of a plant. You can prune that back in the winter time, it pops back out and grows through the summer and mm -hmm. doesn't disrupt the flowering at all. Right. Uh, but there are a few things I'm gonna say that you don't want to prune also. Right. Um, and this is what leads to a lot of confusion because it's a very sort of plant by plant decision. Uh, plants like hydrangeas, rhododendrons, azaleas, a lot of those you want to avoid winter pruning because they already have their flower buds on it. If you were to go out and look at a rhododendron or azalea, the flower buds are already present and if you were to go in there and do your pruning in you know, December, January, February, you'd be removing the flower buds. Um, hydrangea is another good example of that. A lot of people, almost everybody experienced last winter where it was so severely cold that their hydrangeas, the top part of the plant, got killed back. Yes. Now they regenerated and regrew, but there were no flowers on there. Mm -hmm. So that's that same thing with pruning. You want to avoid pruning on them because you're not going to injure the plant, but you could disrupt the flowering. Right. So that's just something you can always call us or attend these classes if you have questions on a plant-by-plant -plant basis. Uh, I also wanted to say in terms of pruning, a lot of people have been calling in and wondering about cutting back various perennials. This again, a lot of these are not right or wrong decisions as a matter of judgment. Uh, this is a picture I just took last week. I like to leave the perennials above ground, even the winter time. Now clearly you see that's that Hakanacola grass, there's some astilbe, they're totally dormant. 
Uh, but I feel like it still adds some interest to the landscape. Absolutely. Uh, so it may be dried up and brown looking. Some people say, oh, it looks dead. And if you want to trim it off, go ahead and trim it off. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, it adds a little bit of interest in so there. Especially when that ice gets on there. This looks very shimmery. Yeah. And exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of preference. And this means, and, and we'll go back to our pictures here, some people might look at this and say, hey, that's messy. And if you think that's messy and unkept looking, then go in and cut it back. Right. I feel like in addition to adding the interest there, it also provides a little bit of winter shelter. And when I say winter shelter, it almost acts as a mulch to help uh, protect the plants a little bit from the temperature extremes, but also insects. Uh, insects need a place to spend the winter. Mm -hmm. And they're not all bad. I mean, most of the time, uh, insects are beneficial. And so examples would be like, you know, ladybugs. They overwinter as an adult. They crawl into cracks and crevices and, you know, between rocks and that type of place. And they shelter up for the winter time. Uh, praying mantis that you see over there, it's a Carolina praying mantis popping up. Um, found him in my garden last summer. Mm -hmm. They overwinter as eggs, but again, they p lay their eggs on the stems of plants. So that's just another reason I like to leave that vegetation in place over the winter time. It's a matter of choice. Right. Provide that shelter. Right. And super quick, I just want to say, mm -hmm. if you're going to do any pruning out there, Really, it's, it's not difficult. You just need a couple basic tools for pruning your trees and shrubs, a good pair of hand pruners. Uh, now, these are actually made by mm -hmm. Corona. They're sort of what I call the imitation Felcos, um, but, mm -hmm. but they're very, very well-made, good quality pruners. A pruning saw, that, that pruner that you're holding, Debbie, will prune anything up to about three quarters of an inch. Mm -hmm. If you start going over that, then all you need is a, um, a pruning saw to get the larger pieces out of it. And then if um, I don't do a lot of shearing, especially in the winter, but if we talk about cutting back those perennials, um, then I just use, because people are always asking how I do it, uh, there's different ways. I just go in here with a pair of hedge trimmers mm -hmm. and use that to cut back the grasses and perennials Great. and stuff like that. So a couple of basic tools, and you're, and you're really set for a good portion of your gardening. Yep, and it's time to do that, and like I say, we'll have a lot more detail in classes if you want to get into specifics on the how-to. Great. Okay, going to take another quick break. We'll be right back. <music> Got to have your black-eyed peas on me. At least we do in my family. Do you, do you really eat black-eyed peas? I think that's the only time I eat them is I have at least a spoonful <laughs> okay. on New Year's Day. <laughs> I, I know it's a tradition, but it it's is. not one that um, <laughs> I've been able to get into. Uh, well, you know, there's not a whole lot to do outside gardening, so it's a perfect time to turn your attention to indoor gardening. Absolutely. Um, and so that's, I was thinking, hey, you know, if, as the holiday decorations start coming down and you maybe want to just go for a different look right. or you know brighten Things up your look home. bare when you first take those those holiday decorations down. Exactly just adding uh, some tropical plants in there can be nice or again you know we have uh, greenhouses all three of our store locations and throughout the winter it's just you wouldn't believe how many people just on their lunch break or oh, something yeah. comes by and they just like to come walk through there mm -hmm. sit for a few minutes or something just to you know be in a nice warm tropical it's a place, place surrounded by that. plants and everything so you're always welcome to come down there now as i i've been saying you know, we're a little bit in this in-between state because right now our greenhouses you know we're still you know we, we're still christmas mode with poinsettias right. and you know lots of cyclamen and all those kind of things and those are winding down and then in the couple weeks ahead we're really going to be beefing up our greenhouses but there's always always beautiful plants to find in there right oh it, it's fun when those truckloads start coming in, probably mid-January, when you just see all these fresh, beautiful plants coming from Florida, and it's great. Yeah, it sure is. But we didn't have any trouble finding anything in there today. No, we either. sure didn't. <laughs> so I'll go through just a couple more pictures just as teasers because mm -hmm. I realize um, this first picture I have are, are begonias, mm -hmm. you know, both for beautiful foliage and beautiful flowers. Those are two different plants. I don't want to mislead anybody. So the uh, the 
pretty leaves on there, the uh, Rex begonias, you know, we have some of those, but the flowering begonias, you know, they're not in not stock right yet. now. Right. And that's always the thing, you know, I try cautioning, but if there's anything really specific that you're looking for, give us a call right. first, because inventories and availabilities, it's a seasonal business and it's constantly right. changing. Well, and it varies from store to store. I mean, we, you know, we basically carry the same of, of everything, but there are some differences, so. Yeah. So again, we we have the Rex begonias in stock, but not the uh, flowering begonias in there. But still, you come in the greenhouse and like say flowers and foliage that's in there, especially plants like cactus and succulents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are, you know, we have that year round, and of course, you know, that's a something that anybody can grow as long as you've got good sunlight. The plants that thrive on neglect and huge diversity that's in oh, there. Oh yes. Uh, you wouldn't believe all the different shapes and forms there's cacti there but we also have plenty of succulents and then of course things like bromeliads uh, which are very easy to grow uh, they, their flowers are extremely long lasting that's in there um, and again lots of different colors that go so you know come on in and like I say you know add these plants to your home mm -hmm. now I brought a few of them in with me today to talk about in a little more detail uh, this is a plant, these are plants that have been around and grown for many, many years, <laughs> not exactly new. But these are just all the ones I'm pulling up to the desk now are examples of uh, Sansevieria. Actually, let me position it over here, we get a little better look at. Uh, these are only a few of the many varieties that we sell at the Garden Center. Uh, so again, the selection goes on and on with these. The thing that's neat, I brought these in. If you say, well, I've got a black thumb or brown right. thumb, or people are convinced that they can't grow you. anything, <laughs> these are plants that just thrive on neglect. Right. They're plants that will tolerate low light levels. Uh, they do better when they're kept on the dry side. Uh, so they are not at all fussy. They're very forgiving. So if you're getting started out, or if you have a difficult location in your home where you feel like just nothing will grow, then these um, different forms of Sansevieria can be good choices for you. Uh, we even have one in the greenhouse that's flowering, which is really unusual. When they bloom, though, they get a, a nice fragrance on there. Mm -hmm. So another that I wanted to show off here in my realm of very durable, tough, reliable plants is this ZZ plant. Um, ZZ plant, or sometimes it's called a cardboard palm, you can actually see it has this very thick, fleshy stem on there. Uh, that's an adaptation to retain moisture in there. So the only thing that can go wrong with this is overwatering. Uh, it's again, it's a plant that thrives on neglect, and it's best if you allow it to dry slightly between waterings. If you have a bright, sunny location, then they stay really vibrant and intense like this in low light levels, their color starts to fade a bit. Uh, so those are some easy ones that you can find in the greenhouse today to look at. Okay, uh, I'm just going to bring a couple over from my side and exactly. show, talk about those. Now this is a uh, Chinese evergreen that I brought in, uh, Aglonemia. It's also in my easy care plant selection, but this is one that actually likes to stay a little bit moist. The plants that I was showing you before, the mother-in-law tongue or the uh, Sansevieria, the uh, also goes by the name of snake plants, all these different names for it, as well as the ZZ plant, they prefer to be on the dry side. Water them, then let them dry out. Now these are plants, these are both an arum family, uh, that Chinese evergreen, as well as this anthurium. They are, believe it or not, they're in the same family. They are plants you want to pretty consistently keep moist. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very easy to grow, um, tolerant in different conditions. Uh, but just kind of not wet, but keep them just slightly moist. And then bouncing back, just I'm one more hold there. This one up here. Uh, that Debbie's showing us. We're switching over now to what is, is definitely a specialty plant. <laughs> I'm just trying to give you a little overview of the type of things you'll find in, in the greenhouses. Of course, that's a pitcher plant. It's a carnivorous plant. Uh, in its natural environment, it grows in very infertile uh, conditions, very moist, but no fertility that's in there. So what they'll do to supplement their diet, so to speak, is they catch and devour insects. Mm -hmm. So in this pitcher plant, the insect crawls down, 
there's a little well of water in there, they get stuck in there and drown, and then as they decay in there, the plant reabsorbs and recycles the nutrients there in there. So these are fun and they're exciting mm -hmm. uh, and add uh, a lot of, entice a lot of interest, especially from kids. But this is not the easiest plant to grow at home. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a plant that likes very humid conditions, bright, sunny conditions. Uh, so it's, it's a bit of a novelty. Uh, but if you have the right environment, I'm trying to say is you, maybe you graduate up to this. If right. you don't have a green thumb, if you don't have a lot of experience, you start with some of these easier ones. And as you get into it and you build experience, then you can uh, just keep branching out. And this interest can just take you as far as you want to go with it. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and talk about some planning during the winter months. It's always time to garden, right? It sure is, <laughs> exactly. That's what we do. We keep finding things for you to do. That's right. Before we get to the planning, um, you've got a couple of things to show to help with the house plants. Right, because when you're inside. talking a little bit about if you're <coughs> turning your attention indoors and growing right. plants inside, uh, oftentimes, actually normally, the number one limiting factor is, is how much light you yes. have. That's why I'm always asking people, that's my first question when they're selecting house plants is, well, how much light do you have available? Right. Because plants, they need sun, they need water, they need nutrients to live. And we can provide the water and the nutrients, but the sun becomes a limiting factor. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the options, of course, is if you, if you don't have bright, sunny conditions, is you can also supplement mm -hmm. uh, that lighting. So I just brought in, you know, and again, we carry a pretty good selection of different right. lighting, but if you need to supplement to an, get more light in there into your home, that then opens up opportunities for you to get more plants into there. Right. Uh, so what happens, these are grow lights. They offer the full spectrum of sunlight. Uh, normally, you know, most of our indoor lighting is tends to be sort of at the blue end of the range. Uh, these light bulbs provide both the blue as well as the red end of that spectrum. And the lighting has changed quite a quite a bit. Oh yes, um, over the years. Right, just like for energy efficiency, you know, the, the incandescent bulbs have been phased out and now they're being replaced with compact fluorescence, mm -hmm. LED, uh, those type of things. So I just brought a couple of these in. And this also leads in a little bit to our sort of our next subject. I'm going to talk about when it comes time to start growing plants from seed. Mm -hmm. And seed starting, again, one of the biggest issues that people have with that is trying to do it with insufficient light. Right. Because pretty much all your seed grown plants require really good bright light conditions right. to, to germinate and get well. Now we don't look like this at Maryfield Garden Center yet, but yes. it, within the next couple of weeks we will. Right. <laughs> Thank you for being very clear on that. When you come into the garden center today, you're going to find fantastic after Christmas That's bargains. Right. <laughs> you are not, not going to find yet. this big extensive <laughs> seed collection. But you know what? Seeds are already showing up in the warehouse. That's great. And what, what our process, and this is following the seasons, the same as you're going to be doing there at home, uh, as we make our way through the Christmas stuff and now all that gets taken down and put away, the first thing that goes up in its place are seeds. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you can start selecting and buying your seeds, you know, as we go into January, February, most of these things. You can get a head start on the season and start them, again, by growing indoors. That's usually um, happens around February, March time period. But we carry a huge variety of seeds. Of, you know, there's no reason to, that you have to go through the catalog sales and stuff. We usually represent five or six right. different suppliers, and each one of those suppliers presenting hundreds of varieties. Mm -hmm. And again, we'll, we'll be addressing that in a lot more detail. We've got like two different seminars on right. the seed starting. We'll talk about detail in the class, but hey, while you're sitting at home and kind of thinking about the year mm -hmm. ahead, uh, keep that in mind as that's well. Right. We'll have all the supplies that you need as well. So that's what's that's nice about coming in and looking at the seeds there. You could pick up everything you need right there. Oh yeah, and like I said, all the seed trays, the soils, everything mm -hmm. you need to get going on that. Right. As we're sitting around kind of dreaming about spring and what's ahead, you know, a lot of us think about that with the bulbs, the tulips and all that popping up. And I wanted to kind of emphasize, if, um, if you have not done so already, you can still plant bulbs. It's not too late in the season. Most of these bulbs, they need a little bit of chilling time in the ground. 
and it occurred to me because uh, they all went on half price sale yesterday. Ah. So, uh, along with our after More Christmas bargains. sale, right? So, if you <coughs> don't already have those bulbs planted, so you get a little better look because this is to entice you in there. You know, whether, like I said, hyacinths, daffodils, tulips. Mm -hmm. uh, these are all bulbs that you can plant now. Uh, the, it, we got this nice 50 degree weather, some good moisture in the ground, so let's go ahead and get them in the ground right away and they'll come back and reward mm -hmm. you next spring. But the bulbs I really wanted to talk about, and we'll proceed now, we have to go to pictures because these are, these are not bulbs I have in stock now, mm -hmm. but thinking ahead in our, in our planning ahead kind of theme. This is a picture is probably taken in July. Right. You know, things <coughs> like cannas, uh, we'll just move through these cannas, those big dramatic foliage and the, and the orange and red flowers mm -hmm. in there that the hummingbirds love so much. Dahlias, uh, if we see our next picture there, uh, really hit their peak bloom in September. And then one that I've, I've made a commitment, this is one of my New Year's resolutions, ah. are gladiolas. I'm going to mm. plant gladiolas. Uh, they don't show up so well in this picture, but this is the thing, gladiolas, it's a lot of times people think of that as sort of an old fashioned flower. They're not, I don't no. know anybody's planting. I couldn't find any garden pictures with them, but here they are in the flower arrangements with that deep purple flower. Mm -hmm. And I've decided I've I got to get these back in my garden. But these things, cannas, dahlias, gladiolas, um, and the caladiums, these are bulbs, corms, and tubers that are planted in the spring. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, this is my looking ahead because we don't have them in stock today. Don't come in the store shopping <laughs> for these. They're not there. But they will be arriving as we go in and the Christmas stuff comes down. Right. These are what we're talking about now are bulbs, corms, and tubers that are not cold hardy. They need to be planted in the spring mm -hmm. so that you get those flowers popping up in the summer. So that's my sort of garden calendar theme of looking what you can do the next few months. And again, I've, I've asked uh, Karen, who's been on the show several times, to do a class on this, because mm -hmm. I've decided that really, we just, they're underutilized. Yes, they, they people have moved away from it for some reason, mm -hmm. and they need to be added back into our gardens. Right. And always remember, you can come into Maryfield Garden Center at any time, talk to our gardening specialists about, about the bulbs, about the tubers, about the corn, about the house plants, go in the greenhouse. We're there for you, and we're open all winter long um, with information. Also, the website is a great place to find information. We've got tips listed for each month. The calendars have, have great tips, so there's always lots of great information at Maryfield Garden Center. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it, right? because sometimes people are surprised that we're even open during mm -hmm. the winter, because right. a lot of garden centers just close down for two or three months in right. winter, but not us. We're there. We're there every day, <laughs> every, right. every day of the year for you. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to take your phone calls, 703-387-1046. So we'll talk to you in just a couple minutes. Hard to believe. Hard to believe. Well, we're taking your phone call, 703-387-1046, and our first caller is Tito, who's calling from Rockville. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Great. Oh, How we're about doing you? Great. Good, good. Uh, David, I just had a couple of questions, actually. You, were, you guys were talking about uh, pruning, and of course, I have some helleborus in my front yard, and uh, I usually wait until the the, they're blooming or actually past their, their blooming time to trim them. I was just wondering, can we trim them now or is it better just to leave the green leaves during the whole, the whole uh, winter? And the second question was, you guys showed also some uh, pitcher plants. I have a couple of them and uh, mine are getting uh, a little longer and really actually maybe a little too tall and i was just wondering if you if they can be replanted if, if you advise to repot them or uh or how do you do them yeah. oh both excellent questions i'm so glad you called because that's a perfect little segue i i had brought hellebores <laughs> in with me and so there's a chance to show them all. Did you uh, call him and tell him to call him? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but we, um, we had a lot of hellebores, the Christmas rows in there, mm -hmm. you know, and we have these now for for, um, for the holiday right. season also. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a 
non-traditional uh, flower, but you can give that as a nice little Christmas gift. Uh, now, what as Tito is mentioning, these are evergreen perennials. Uh, so they go through the winter months with this really beautiful green foliage, which is just another asset, another plus to having them. And what I've found I like to do is I let them go through the winter time. And usually, let's say, sometime it might be around February, when I just start to see the new growth beginning to pop up through the ground. At that time, I go out with some scissors and I just kind of selectively cut off any leaves that are that are browned and burned or damaged or just basically not pretty anymore. So really there's, uh, and there's no set way, Tito, but there's really no point where I, I just cut the whole plant back. I, um, I guess you could do that, but I'd rather wait when I start to see that new growth emerging and then take a little time with scissors and selectively mm -hmm. thin and cut out the brown foliage. But um, I would hold off on that. I would not do it now because, again, the evergreen foliage is one of the main points of interest that the plant has to offer. Mm -hmm. uh, in regard to the pitcher plant, if it's getting kind of leggy and sprawly the way you're describing, my first thought is that's probably it would benefit from getting some additional light. It's probably the days are short. There's less light that's in there. Uh, even if you could provide some supplemental lighting, that would probably be the best thing you could do for the plant. Um, if it is at a point when it needs to be repotted, I'd say then go ahead and do that. But uh, again, I would rather do that uh, a little bit later in the year, more towards March or something. Let me ask, do you, do you keep it indoors year round or is this something that you move outside for the summertime? Well, actually, I usually, I usually just take them out whenever it's raining because I know they don't like very hard water. So I just take them out for a little bit when it's raining and then I bring them back in. So that's basically what I do. Okay. Uh, again, you could really repot at any time, but I would say the very best time is probably going to be when the days are getting a little longer, the temperatures are warmer, going to more of an active growth season, you know, which would be more towards March. Okay, great. And uh, black, black spots on the leaves of the helloboras, that doesn't mean anything, does it? Like, I, I'm, they're developing a lot of black spots all over the place. It's that like normal or... Well, I see that a lot of times, and that could be a, a fungal leaf spot, but again, my, it's nothing I ever spray or treat. I feel like it's something that, again, when I go into that March time period, anything that just doesn't look pretty or it's not attractive, I just cut that off and throw it away, you know, and I think that's the best way to manage it. It probably is a fungal leaf spot, so technically it's a disease, but nothing that's going to get out of hand or nothing that's really harmful to the plant. Great. Happy okay, New Year, thing. Tito. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you, guys. Happy New Year. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, Susan is calling from Fairfax. Hi, Susan. Hey, how are you doing? Great. And doing you? Doing great. Good. I was just wondering what some colorful bulbs are to plant um, in a local area that are deer-resistant. Oh. Here's the $64,000 question. Yeah. <laughs> now, if you talk about spring flowering bulbs and things that you could literally, you, you normally, I say, hey, try getting in the ground by Christmas, but um, so, I mean, is something you could do this weekend or over the next couple weeks. Uh, it's probably some of the best and most reliable foolproof for any type of daffodil, and there's so many different daffodils. And they also multiply with time, so I think that's a really great value that's in there and all different color combinations. Um, hyacinths, the deer tend to leave those alone, and of course they have the nice fragrance that's in there. Uh, those are the two that come to mind right away. Now on the bulb labels, because it's such a problem, they're usually labeled deer resistant. You'll see a little symbol of the deer with the cross go through it. So if you come in to look for them, uh, they'll be identified. Alliums um, are another one. They're uh, the flowering onions or, or just grouped together called alliums. Again, beautiful bulbs um, and nobody squirrels, deer, you know, animals leave them alone. So you've got several choices. Great. Thanks so much for the phone call, Susan. Have a great weekend. Okay, Jim is calling from, from Bethesda. Are you there, Jim? Yes, I am. Good morning. Yeah, How are good you? Good morning. Good morning. Love your show. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Um, I've got a question about uh, kind of pruning back a pine tree. I have uh, something like a blue spruce, an old Christmas tree we planted, and it's starting to take over the driveway, brushing the cars as we come in and out. Mm -hmm. Can I cut back about maybe uh, all the way around, maybe uh, 8 inches, 10, 10, 10 inches or so? You've got to be really cautious about, about this, Jim. What happens is uh, on, on other plants, let's say a holly, for example, broadleaf plants, on a holly, all up and down that stem, they're dormant buds, and you can cut that back, you know, 
two inches, two feet, you can cut it back as much as you want, and there are dormant buds that will pop back out and regrow. On conifers, uh, like spruce and pine, their growing points, their, their buds are only at the tips of those branches. So you really can't shear very far back into the plant. Um, if you cut back into where it's just kind of woody growth, it's not able to regrow or re-sprout. So you have to just be very stingy is the word that I use. Mm -hmm. Or if you go in there and you prune the plant aggressively and you create a bald spot, it will never fill back in. That's always there. So if you're removing branches or pruning back into there, just be really sure that that's what you want to do because you only get one chance at it. It's not going to regrow. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, the way these are pruned is we wait till what we call the candle season. And usually around uh, late April, May time period, you'll see that terminal bud, that tip starts to elongate and stretch out. Mm -hmm. And it looks just like a candle. Right. That's why they call it the candle season. And that's the time that we go in and prune them and we just do a little bit of light shearing out the tips of the branch and don't go back too aggressively. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a little bit of a yes and no answer. I'm saying you can prune them, but you gotta be stingy uh, and thoughtful about it. And really the best time is when you're starting to see those um, tips, those new buds elongate out. Great, thanks All so right. much, Jim. All right, thank you very much. Have okay. a great weekend and happy new year. I can tell Jim was a little disappointed with that I answer. Know, Not what he wanted I to know, hear, but I know. Well, it's just what it is. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk to Mike and Charlotte, so stay tuned. Okay, welcome back. We're at our last segment. This hour just flies by, but let's talk to Mike, who's calling from Seneca, Maryland. Hi, Mike. Hi, how are you? Great, and uh, you? Just fantastic. Yeah, my question on dahlia, I had some dahlias I planted this year, and the top growth has all died off, and I wonder if I need to dig them up, the tuber bulb, bulbous part, and yes. if it's too late to do it now, or if I could do it, say, like on a pretty day like today. Uh, I would do it as soon as possible. I don't think you're too late. Uh, I know it was really cold around Thanksgiving, but hopefully those tubers are still in good condition. I, I think they will be. Uh, some years, and, it, and you never really know some years, um, dahlias will survive through the winter time. Uh, but if you really want to be sure, you know, kind of on the safe rather than sorry side, then the best thing is to lift them out of the ground. Uh, knock all the loose dirt off of them. Just bring, put them someplace where they can kind of air dry. And then at that point in time, after they are dried and sort of cleaned off, put those tubers into storage where they ideally want to be at about 50, 55 degrees in a dark location, you know, so basement or garage or something like that. Uh, sometimes it, people dust them in a little bit of sulfur uh, just to help prevent any rot over the winter time. But Great, yeah, I, would, um, I, I would get to that as soon as possible. Char All right, thank Perfect you. day to do it. Right. Thanks. Thanks so much for the call. Okay, our next caller is Charlotte, who's calling. I've got to hear that you're calling from Hanover, Pennsylvania. You're not in Han Hanover, Pennsylvania right now, are you? No, I'm at my mom's right okay. now. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought, oh, that would be very cool. So you're from <laughs> Hanover? I'm from Maryland, but I moved to Hanover, I guess, about mm, seven years ago. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome back home. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What's your question today? <laughs> but uh, I saw your show, which um, you're on, and uh, I saw your your gardens, and they looked all, you know, really beautiful. So I thought, well, okay, I'll get your catalog, and I guess I'll start, you know, preparing my seeds. Oh, good. And, Excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. You know. Look what you got, and That's great. You know, probably start ordering from you. <laughs> well, we don't have a catalog. You can go on online and see what you know the type of things that we we have. But uh, as David was yeah. saying, the seeds are, are will be coming in soon, and and that type of thing. So okay, yeah. but so, so I'll you're just close go online. enough. You're you're close enough to come into the store though and see us. We have people travel from all over. We get people from New Jersey. That's right. We get people from New York. We get people from North Carolina to travel. So. Oh, well, okay, so where is your, I see, mm -hmm. okay, 
Maryfield Gardens. Right. Okay, I'll look it up and then uh, we're in Virginia. We get got, down we're there in Virginia location. sometime in the spring. That's great. Thank you okay. so much for the call. Glad to have you okay. watching. Take Looking care. Forward to Enjoy the holidays. You. Thanks. Great. Right. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, our next caller is Cindy. Um, and let's see where I. Cindy, where are you calling from, Cindy? Landover. Landover. Great. Good morning. How are you? Fine, thank you. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. My question is, I dug my hibiscus up, or as my family member calls it, a hot biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's flowering in my house. I have it in my basement. Mm -hmm. And could you tell me what else I'm, I, I can do to maintain it? And okay. also, one family member said you should cut it back, but the other one said um, you don't cut them back. And um, I didn't cut mine, but my one family member cut uh, hers back. So um, how do you maintain it? Well, it's, that's the way it is with gardening. You know, there's no one exact that's answer. Right. <laughs> um, it always depends a little bit on what your situation is, what your objectives are and stuff. Now, I can tell you, it's hibiscus. It's a tropical flower. If if you have a really bright, sunny environment and you can keep it actively growing, it will grow and flower for you all winter long. But to do that, it requires really as much bright and sunny conditions as you can. You want to sort of keep it consistently moist and then maybe um, fertilize it, just like fertilizing about once a month. And if you have that, you can keep it growing uh, through, the, through the entire winter. Now, a lot of us, don't have those conditions and like you mentioned if it's in the garage or basement if it's a lower light dark environment you're probably going to see it yellow shed leaves drop off of there you're going to kind of let it go to sleep for the winter time back way off in the watering just give it enough water to um, you know keep it alive and it's eventually it will probably stop flowering and you just get it survived through the winter at that point I would cut it back and then move it back right. outdoors for the summer. Okay. Okay. Well, I, it's doing all of that. It's flowering, and um, it gets it gets doesn't get super sunny, but it does get light, and um, it, it lost all its leaves. But so it looks it appears that some leaves are, um, are beginning to grow again. Okay. Good. What the plant's doing is it's acclimating to its new environment. It's gone through this sort of adaptation where it shed the yeah. leaves it's acclimating, it's regrowing. So I would say you probably just need to water That's just right. enough to, so it doesn't dry out completely. And I, and I apologize, we've run okay, totally thank you so out of time. All right, thank but you. keep Have up the good work. All right, thank, thank you. you, happy new year. Thank you, happy new year to bye you, bye. and happy new year to everyone out there. Thank you for joining us this, this entire year. We look forward to another great year here at Maryville's Gardening Advisor. Uh, next week, you're gonna be talking about new year, new landscape. Yep, Renetta will be here with lots mm -hmm. of design ideas for That's your garden. Great. So have a wonderful week, bye-bye.